You might already know that the speed of causality is roughly 300,000 kilometers per second. That's the same as the speed of light in a vacuum. So why do we often say speed of light instead of speed of causality? And why does light have to travel at the speed of light? Let's find out more. So what do we mean by causality? Well, causality is cause and effect. One event has to happen before another event can be triggered. If I flick a switch, then the light comes on. But the order of that matters. Cause, then effect. That might sound obvious, but stick with me because it's going to get more interesting. So what do we mean by the speed of causality? Well, we often say that light travels at a universal speed limit. But really, it's causality that sets that limit. Light just happens to move at that limit, in a vacuum. That's very important. That's partly a historical naming quirk. Light was the first thing that we measured that travels at this maximum speed. So the constant C got labelled the speed of light. In reality, any massless particle or signal or any form of information, including forces, can't exceed this speed. Even gravity and electromagnetic forces act at or below this speed limit. The symbol C that I've mentioned stands for celerity, and that means swiftness, not causality. But it's still exactly what it represents. The fastest anything can influence anything else. So let's look at an example. Let's imagine a scenario. It's the future, and I'm here on Earth. And my friend is living on Ganymede, one of Jupiter's moons. Ganymede Base has a detector that flips a switch and plays a recorded birthday message the moment it detects a laser signal from me. It's midnight on her birthday, and I turn on my laser beam aimed right at Ganymede. Luckily, Jupiter and Earth are at one of their closest points, so the distance is only about 33 light minutes. This means that my laser beam, travelling at sea, will take 33 minutes to reach her. Even though it's travelling at the fastest possible speed in the universe, there's no way around that 33 minute delay. And we can actually put this onto a graph. And this is called a Minkowski diagram. It's a useful tool that we get from relativity that helps us to understand space-time. Don't forget that general relativity introduced the idea that space and time are not separate entities, but intertwined into a four-dimensional construct called space-time. In this diagram, the x-axis signifies space, so all of the spatial dimensions are represented on this single axis. Time is represented on the y-axis here. Minkowski diagrams are always drawn from the point of view of a specific observer. For instance, imagine a car next to me. Currently, it's stationary, and so it will draw a vertical line as it's moving forward through time, but not through space relative to me. If the car starts to drive away from me, it now starts to move both through time and through space. So back to our laser beam. This laser beam will be travelling away from me through space at the speed c. The Minkowski diagram is scaled so that time and space have equal scales on the diagram. This means that a beam of light will have a line on this diagram that is of 45 degrees. This line then will represent something travelling at the speed of c, so my laser beam. Let's look a little deeper into this interesting diagram. Imagine I don't want to rely on my laser beam and I want to go and wish my friend 
happy birthday in person. It's the future, so I have a spaceship. And because it's the future, it's much faster than any spaceship today. Even so, it's going to take me 20 days to reach Jupiter. Well, let's put that onto our diagram. I have to travel the same distance, so the distance on the x-axis will be the same. But it's going to take me much longer to get there, so the distance on the time axis is going to be much longer. This means that the line representing my journey from the point of view of the Earth is going to look something like this. And what this means for the Minkowski diagram is that all movements must describe lines at angles more than 45 degrees. Any line in this part of the diagram will be travelling faster than light, as it will be travelling the same distance, but it will be taking less time to do so. And that's not allowed. So is there a way to get my birthday message to my friend any quicker? What about if I built a gigantic rod that stretch from the Earth to Ganymede, and I pushed one end of the rod to send an instant birthday wish. Surely, the other end of the rod would move straight away as I pushed one end, right? Well, actually, no. The push would propagate through the atoms in the stick. One set of atoms will jostle the set of atoms next to them, and they would jostle the atoms next to them, and so on, all the way along the stick. And the atoms can't travel faster than the speed of light. In fact, they travel much, much slower. This means that my push can't go any faster than the speed of light. And as I've said in practice, it'll go much, much slower. So the speed of light isn't really about light at all, it's really the speed of causality. And we happen to know the speed of causality because we've measured the speed of light. And light travels at the speed of causality. In fact, light travelling in a vacuum has to travel at the speed of light. But why? Well, photons are massless particles, and so must always move at the speed of light. And the reason all comes back to this equation. Actually, it comes back to the full version of this equation, which looks more like this. This new stuff here is all about momentum, and momentum is all about movement. This means that if a particle is at rest, its momentum is zero, and so the equation then becomes E equals mc squared. And the particle's energy then comes from its mass. However, if a particle has no mass, like a photon of light, then all its energy must come from its momentum. A particle can't have no mass and no momentum, because that would mean its energy would be zero and it wouldn't exist. This then means that particles that have no mass must have momentum. This means that they must always be moving they must be constantly moving, they can never be at rest in any frame of reference. But I said that photons must always move at the speed of light, and all I've done so far is said that photons must always be moving, not that they have to move at the speed of light. So why do they have to move at the speed of light all the time? This all comes back to relativity again. Let's imagine that the speed of light is 100 miles an hour. Then if I shone light from a torch, the photons of light would be moving forwards at 100 miles an hour. I would then be able to get into a fast car and move at the same speed as the photons. This would mean that from my frame of reference, the photons would have a speed of zero. And I've just said that light can never have a speed of zero in any frame of reference. In reality then, if I'm driving a car at 100 miles an hour and I shone a torch, light will still be moving ahead of me at the speed of C. If I'm travelling at half the speed of light in a spaceship, 
light will still be moving ahead of me at the speed c. We've accelerated particles to more than 99% the speed of light. And if I was riding on top of one of those particles and shone a light in front of me, it would still be moving ahead of me at the speed of c. So no matter how fast I'm going, the speed of light will always be c. From any frame of reference, no matter my speed, light will always be moving ahead of me at c. So, what other things will travel at this universal speed limit? Gravity for one. According to Newtonian gravity, the force of gravity should be felt instantaneously. In other words, a change in gravity should be felt instantaneously, irrespective of distance. However, we know that gravity is a distortion of space-time, and so then that means that the fastest that these distortions can travel through space-time is c, the speed of causality. In reality, this means that if the sun suddenly disappeared, then we wouldn't see it disappear for nearly eight and a half minutes. That's the time it takes light to travel from the sun to the earth. We'd also continue to orbit the space where the sun used to be for the same amount of time, until the gravity, the change in gravity, caught up with us and we sailed off on our merry way. But how do we know that gravity travels at the speed of light? Einstein's equations tell us that mass and energy curve space-time. When massive objects accelerate, like two black holes orbiting each other, they can create waves that travel outwards at the speed of light. These are gravitational waves, and they propagate at the speed c. This means that if something cataclysmic happens in a distant galaxy, like two neutron stars merging, the resulting gravitational wave signal travels millions of light years to reach the Earth. As a gravitational wave passes by, it stretches and squeezes space itself, very slightly changing the distance between two points. Even for huge cataclysmic events, these changes are minuscule, but we're able to detect them using instruments such as LIGO in the United States. And this is a gravitational wave detector. They work by shining laser beams down long tunnels and reflecting them off mirrors. As a passing gravitational wave stretches or shrinks the distance between the mirrors by a tiny amount, this then can be detected. Our first detection of gravitational waves was in 2015, and this event came from the merger of two black holes about 1.3 billion light years away. The signal matched Einstein's predictions almost perfectly, confirming gravitational waves' existence and behaviour. Then in 2017, LIGO and Virgo, a European equivalent, detected gravitational waves from a neutron star collision. Telescopes also saw electromagnetic signals or light signals. This let us study the event from both gravity and light's perspective. The gravity wave and the electromagnetic signals reach the Earth virtually simultaneously, confirming that light and gravity both travel at sea. And finally, before I finish, I'd like to say a big thank you to the people at Solar System Scope for the planet textures that I used, which are amazing, and also to Bjorn Johnson for the maps of Ganymede, Callisto and Io, which are also brilliant. These materials were all used under a Creative Commons license, full credit and links in the description, so thank you very much. Well, that's about it for light and its speed and causality. But for now, and until next time, thank you for watching.